Well, good afternoon and welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for yet another action-packed episode of this show. Uh, are you staying warm and indoors today? Yes, the temperature right now is hovering around zero. So winter has finally arrived in the land of the frozen chosen, in the land of 10,000 taxes. Yes, one for each lake. Uh, so... Uh, hope you're staying warm, hope you're staying indoors, and of course I'm glad you're joining in and watching our program today. So thanks for uh, visiting. Uh, I'm going to start off today by going back a couple of weeks. Our January 2nd show, uh, and you can catch, uh, in, in mark my words when I say this, go back to look at our archives, youtube.com slash northstaroasis, and look at January 2nd for what I'm about to tell you right now. We're going to jump right back into our Iowa caucus coverage for the, uh, for the uh, presidency. We are down to 52 and a half weeks before our next inauguration uh, for the next president of the United States, whoever that will be. And on January 2nd, I said... For Bernie Sanders to win the Democrat nomination, he has to perform very strongly in Iowa, and at that time he had a double-digit deficit. Hillary Clinton was leading by, if memory serves correct, about 13 points in the polls. He needs to cut that to mid-single digits or better, and he needs to be able to surge within that last 30 days before going into the Iowa caucuses. Well, guess what he has done? According to the Des Moines Register Bloomberg poll, the most recent one that came out just the other day, Hillary Clinton, 42%, Bernie Sanders, 40%. So Bernie Sanders has actually cut the deficits to minus 2, not minus 13, minus 2, with about 16 days left before uh, the uh, February 1st Iowa caucus. The uh, PPP poll, from also from uh, January 10th, Hillary Clinton 46, Bernie Sanders 40. ARG poll from January 10th, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders 47, Hillary Clinton 44. Quinnipiac, uh, also January 10th, Bernie Sanders 49, Hillary Clinton 44. I would rate this, when you factor in the margin of error, I would rate this race right now a toss-up. And there's only two weeks left to go before the Iowa caucus. So that just tells me that, one, North Star Oasis has been able to give you the news before it happens. So, yes, we are right again. And even going back to uh, April when Bernie Sanders first came here, one of the things I said is that Bernie Sanders is going to be a force to reckon within, within the Democratic Party. He has tapped into the sentiment of the Democrat base voters, and Hillary Clinton had better watch out. By the, and I have people in, in April, Republicans and Democrats alike, both tell me that, oh, there's no way that Bernie Sanders is going to stand a chance. And I said, mark my words, by fall, they were looking at me and saying, how did you predict that? Now, January 2nd, I said, Bernie Sanders has to cut into single, single digit, narrow that margin, and surge by Iowa straw, uh, the Iowa caucus, and he has a chance of winning the nomination. Because what happens right after that? We go right on over to New Hampshire, eight days later. And Bernie Sanders currently has a, according to the Monmouth poll, uh, also from January 10th, a 53 to 39% lead over Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. Of course, his state is Vermont right next door. So what does this tell me? What does this tell us? This tells us that if Bernie Sanders can win the Iowa caucuses, and if Bernie Sanders wins the New Hampshire primary, it is, I'm not going to say it's going to be game over for Hillary Clinton, but her opportunities of advancing into victory are going to be tremendously narrowed. And this is going to be something very concerning if you're a Hillary Clinton supporter, that Bernie Sanders is starting to surge right now. That is news that you have to be keeping an eye on for the next couple of weeks because it's going to be an amazing um, 
very, very tight knit group. Well, let's see how Hillary responds to this. I mean, is she going to go angry and negative and attack Bernie? Or is Bernie going to really, you know, put an attack out on Hillary? We don't know, but that's what the, the, the atmosphere is coming up for the next two weeks. And changing over to the Republican side, really there's been not much of a change since we discussed this last week. Uh, it's Trump, Cruz, and Rubio. That's been about it. We had a major debate. Um, really out of that debate, uh, the one thing that I noticed was that uh, Jeb Bush is probably still shell-shocked in the fact that he's not leading the pack. He's in the middle of the pack, and he's soon to be dropped. He's going to be going towards the end of the pack because people are just tired of the Bushes, just like they're tired of the Clintons. Uh, otherwise, Trump, Cruz, and Rubio each gave strong performances, and when I watched I also noticed that uh, Chris Christie also gave a strong performance, but he's sitting around also where uh, Jeb Bush is, and there's no, no guarantee that he's actually going to recover from that. So in uh, 52 and a half more weeks, we'll have a next president chosen. It's going to be out of this crop of candidates. I really don't see another candidate for either party entering the race, although on the Democrat side, I could be wrong on that one. Uh, but it's, it's now going to heat up as people are paying attention. And we've given you, for the last year now, we've given you know, weekly updates on what's going on. We're going to continue, but that's the most recent breaking news is the fact that Bernie Sanders and Hillary are pretty much now in a toss-up race in Iowa. And another thing that happened this week, keeping in with a theme that we had from last month, is a meeting at the South Washington County School District. We had brought on uh, Andrea uh, Brussel, I think her name is, uh, from, an from the organization that is challenging the South Washington County School District. They went to court, uh, I believe it was January 3rd. Um, some, we had also updated on it. And then they had a meeting last week to discuss what had happened when uh, Judge Kathy Guerin had ruled against their group and in favor of the school district. Uh, and with things of this nature, there's also the potential of retaliation. So I'm going to play you a clip right now from Paul Dorr. He's a consultant. Uh, he was at this meeting. Our producer was at this meeting, and uh, this is video that he shot. So let's take a look at Paul Dorr talking about retaliation in a previous initiative that he was involved with. I wanted to be, uh, you know, thinking that I would be here in this position, but it being sued for three billion, I'm not near near worth that. So we, uh, uh, you know, this will be the third time now the school district had sued us uh, for district court attorney's fees, and then. Uh, uh, appeals court attorneys fees that was about thirty thousand dollars each and now they're suing for three million and I can guarantee you they ain't gonna get that because they're not worth that so I feel real confident with the, with our case Eric that uh, you know we're gonna win but it's been since it's almost been 60 days and we're, you know I haven't sleep this nights you know about what what's taken ju the judge so long you know talking about you know getting involved I think you know, one of the issues that a lot of us probably are, are thinking about is the term retaliation. I mean, it's been mentioned. You know, I think that's probably you know, a psych factor is the fact. I mean, uh, people are, you know, they don't want to be sued $3 million. And so that's got to be an issue for them, isn't that? How do you address that? Um, let me do a reference. When, this, when we look at the budget in our county and the response by the sheriff when we looked at the county attorney's budget and the sheriff's budget was out of control, his response was to deny me my concealed permit without cause, with no basis whatsoever. He admitted he had no basis. He only did it uh, to, to retaliate against my free speech right. These guys filed a Second Amendment claim, and then when they realized what was all going on, it became a First Amendment claim, and before it was done, the federal judge on the bench, as, as what Eric just said, in addition, he then ruled, he asked these guys and the county's council, you give me briefs and advise me if I don't have the authority, but if I do, Mr. Sheriff, I'm sending you back to college. You're going to be required to pass a course in the Constitution on the, on the First Amendment <laughs> free speech rights. And he did, and the sheriff had to take an online class on the Constitution, and it humiliated him. And honestly, they're in a cop in Northwest Iowa now that wants to pull me over. <laughs> because, you know, so, when it, and what they're doing here now with, um, excuse me, uh, Nathan, is, is um, go back after them and, and get sanctions against them. We have to start fighting. 
Because if we just live in fear of the retaliation, we're done. They got us exactly where they want. We have to start taking the risk, putting it on the line. If we don't, who's going to? Our kids, our grandkids? And, and honestly, folks, I work in nine states. I don't know a lawyer like Eric, any of the nine states, anywhere, who is willing to do what he does. You know, we've got to hang on money once in a while, and there's sometimes you can't do stuff, but these guys got to get paid too. But there's nobody going after the heart of the beast at the level these guys are going after. So you have a, you have a special gift here in, in Minnesota, and I'm not saying that because you won my case, because I know uh, I've watched their cases and worked with them with some, and they're in the fight for you people. So you've got some legal help there as well, but if we live in the fear of the retaliation, they got us right where, where, where they want us. I just wanted to say about the Osceola County uh, case that uh, Paul was involved in, and this relates to journalism coverage. Uh, the, the journalists I found, at least for me, uh, they, they really like my work. And so the journalists have been very friendly because they think that the agencies, uh, there's a level of uh, corruption, but it's not pointed out. So I'm pointing it out. I'm going to the controversies. But it's interesting on the journalistic coverage of Paul's case that it was kind of like here, and then all of a sudden it went up here. And, and the, re the reason was, was Judge Bennett, the U.S. District Court judge in Iowa, required the sheriff, <coughs> Sheriff Weber, to, re to report back to the court his grade in the online <laughs> U.S. Constitution <laughs> First Amendment course. And he got a hook, he got a big C, and that, that went viral. That was, that, was, that was the biggest moment in the case, was, the, was reporting back the grade. And so I, I have to say that the retaliation is a concern. I'm here to help anyone on a retaliation claim in Minnesota, and I'm glad to take the calls. But, it, you know, it's, I just want A rundown, but to see the fact that a sheriff, a county sheriff, was actually retaliating against Mr. Doerr in Osceola County, uh, Iowa, and then ended up having to take a course on the Constitution, Th that's powerful stuff. That is really powerful stuff, and that's, that's the way the bureaucracy does impact things around in even our neighborhoods. And so, uh, you know, that's the one thing that, you know, we've always got to be, you know, on the guard for is, are you being retaliated against? Now, I'm not going to be one to take a look and say that uh, you, you, you got to be paranoid that everybody's out to get you. No, not at all. But there are clear cases of abuse within the system, and that clearly was one of them. And it's funny to see that uh, the sheriff had to take the course. And then, of course, when you have, uh, and he did badly with a C, and then not only that, but you also had a judge who did, who got a C grade. Now, a, fe a, a state judge, you would think, would get a little bit better of a grade than a C, since, you know, dealing with the law and the Constitution was what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you're getting a C and you're a judge, that's kind of um, not so good. And, you know, maybe that's not a bad idea and uh, that's something for maybe either another day or another show or somebody else's show is what would the grades of judges in Minnesota get if they actually had to take, um, if they had to take, um, oh, okay, I, I was given a clarification. It was not the judge, but it was the sheriff who got the grade. But nonetheless, I would like to see what would sheriffs and uh, judges in Minnesota get if they had to take an online uh, class on the Constitution. That's just a, a question that I have right now. This was actually the first I've seen the video, so I, you know, that's why I'm not quite straight with uh, with my facts. Um, it's been a long week this week, but um, notwithstanding, I, w I would love to be able to see what these folks get as a grade for an online course on the Constitution. I think that's that might be something to uh, to push for. But anyhow, moving on. South Washington County School District meeting. So there was that little clip about the retaliation and the judge getting his uh, C grade on the Constitution. But that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to that. And this is Eric Cardall, the attorney for the uh, Citizens Group in South Washington County uh, speaking. Uh, legally complex cases, and I thought I could make a contribution to Minnesota uh, by uh, choosing an area that wasn't uh, heavily uh, harvested, and that is representing citizens and businesses and landowners in lawsuits against the government, or defending lawsuits brought by the government against the same. And uh, little did I know uh, that uh, this was an area with lots of opportunity, because Minnesota governments are violating the law all the time. 
and it's almost like there isn't any oversight. The legislature doesn't watch them, the governor doesn't watch them. In fact, the legislature and the governor are violating the laws themselves. So everyone's <laughs> violating the laws, everyone's making money by violating the laws. And for example, the last two big uh, bonding bills, remember the Minnesota Constitution requires 60%? Well, the Vikings made up the idea of an appropriation bond. That only requires 50% plus one. Now, the new state senate office building, uh, they made up the, na the name uh, lease, uh, re lease revenue bond. But the property was owned by the government, leased to the government. Well, that only requires 50% plus one. So there's big money in violating procedures and laws. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is a very specific subject area where, where I've probably been involved with at least 10, maybe 15 lawsuits and that is school district elections. So believe it or not, I've had all those lawsuits and I have knowledge about how school districts run elections because I've been there. So I'm gonna mention six different areas of uh, school district, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, legal corruption, all right? So you're here and I'm gonna educate you about what I've seen at the, at the litigation level. I mean, I've actually gone in and I've extracted the facts myself, I've studied the facts, and I'm gonna present them to you. So this is inductive reasoning, right? I'm giving you facts, and you can come to your own conclusions. Deductive would be I start with some high principle and work our way down. So let's begin with the first area. Uh, school districts have, have uh, been legally corrupt in the sense of not making proper campaign finance disclosures. So school districts are using taxpayer funds to promote ballot questions. If any of us use our own funds to promote or defeat ballot questions, we have to file campaign finance reports. Uh, we sued school districts. Uh, the one, the big case ended up being St. Louis County School District. And what they had done is they signed up a general contractor before the referendum passed, Johnson Controls. And Johnson Controls was the general contractor that would end up getting paid more than $10 million in fees. It ran the campaign for the bond referendum in conjunction with the school district. It provided pre-election consulting, and it advised on the strategic plan. So if you, bought, if you hire the general contract with those financial incentives to advise you on the strategic plan, what are they going to recommend? More buildings, right? So, so we, we, we sued them, and it took a case, the Minnesota Court of Appeals 3-0, a Minnesota Supreme Court decision 7-0, written by Justice Alan Page, and we won, and they were forced to report. But the, the state auditor cast a doubt on the meaning of these things, and other officials did. And so we still don't have statewide reporting by school districts when they do this. We won one case, one school district reported, but the school districts are bucking following even a law which has been interpreted 7-0, left, right, liberal, conservative, our way. This is how badly school districts want to not disclose their use of taxpayer funds. Two, taxpayer spending. In, the, in those cases, the Minnesota Court of Appeals, former Congressman David Mingi agreed with our argument that they have, not only do they have to disclose it, but it's illegal to use taxpayer funds on one side of the ballot question. It's illegal. And here, again, the state auditor intervened and expressed a position after the Minnesota Supreme Court did not repeat the exact same words the Court of Appeals did, but didn't upset the ruling, that there's still a doubt. Now, this is in, despite the fact a 1966 Attorney General's opinion written by liberal Democrat Miles Lord <laughs> said that school districts can't do this. So I'm on the side of the 1996 Attorney General's opinion by Miles Lord. I'm on the side of the Minnesota Court of Appeals uh, decision by David Mingi, and the St. Louis County School District is still fighting that with the help of the Office of Administrative Hearings judges who said there's still a doubt. And when I was in front of the panel last week, the judges were questioning, and I told the judges, look, your earlier panel decision is law the case, you have to follow it, or precedent, you have to follow it, or you accept what the school district says, it's dicta, which means it's meaningless. But every time I've been in front of the Court of Appeals, you always follow the earlier panel decision in the same case. So you can see the uphill battle that we're fighting. We keep winning, but the school districts want to keep spending taxpayer money, and they don't want to disclose it. 
They want to sign up the general contractors to run the campaigns and to give them advice on the long range of strategic planning. So it, it, it's, there's no election integrity in that. When something goes on a ballot, a ballot question, it should be a fair fight between the yeses and the noes. The, no, the yeses raise money, the noes raise money, you fight, and, and whoever gets the most votes wins. And with the, when, but when the school district is using taxpayer funds, and here undisclosed use of taxpayer funds, it's not a fair fight. Uh, the liberal justice, Chief, uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, when he was on the New Jersey uh, equivalent of the Supreme Court, he had this question before him. And he said, well, it wouldn't be fair to the taxpayers who oppose the question if the school district was using the funds to support the question. That there can't be one-sided spending, one-sided partnership spending of, uh, ta of taxpayer funds. The third area of, of corruption would be the conflict of interest that I described. And I think it's a very serious matter. It's the one area where we haven't litigated in much. But that idea is that up front, before the ballot question is approved by the school board, we need to get in there and look at who these consultants are. And we have to bring action to the school board. You can't rely on a consultant on your long-term strategic plan if they stand to make $10 million on buildings down the road. I mean, there's a contract, phase three, which was very difficult to get even after the election. And the phase three contract in St. Louis County School District laid out all these things. That is, you know, you'd do the pre-election consulting, you'd, do, you'd run our campaign, you'd do the communication strategy, the polling was part of that. They were polling voters, encouraging them to vote for the question. And then, oh, by the way, if it passes, you get a $10 million fee for the general, uh, for the general contractor work. So that, that's not election integrity, that's a huge uh, conglomerate company running a school board, running a school board election, running a school board construction project all at one time. Now with respect to South Washington County a School District, this is the fourth area, and we found out about the election contests regarding votes. And so here I'm gonna use a couple uh, exhibits, but let's just uh, lay out what happened was uh, the the uh, election here occurred in $95 million or so of bonds, and it, came, it was a very close vote. And there were uh, eight, 19 ballots that were challenged, one one was withdrawn, so there were a total of 18 ballots challenged, and 17 of the ballots were very similar. They were all instances where the voter put uh, the voter's oval on top of no instead of the empty oval next to no. And then there was one that was a little different where both ovals were filled in and there is an X on top of the oval is filled in for yes. And so we went to the canvassing board meeting, but initially, uh, sorry, I was sort of shocked by the canvassing board uh, wasn't independent. The special statute for canvassing boards, written by, I wonder who's lobbyists, uh, said that the canvassing board would consist of two school board members and three others. Now I like the two of the other three others were uh, the clerk of court, you know, that's a person who, is held to a high standard, and also the, the, the local county auditor, an election manager. And then the last person was a, a mayor designee, or mayor or mayor designee, and that ended up being Woodbury. Well, the canvassing board uh, just wouldn't follow our arguments because there's a statute that's directly applicable to counting votes, and it, it's titled, you know, Determining Voters' Intent. And the statute uh, evolved, particularly after the Coleman-Franken race, to be very specific that if it's possible, basically no vote can be rejected unless it's impossible to determine the voter's intent according to these principles. And two of the principles that applied were these. One, uh, if, the, if the voter's mark is near the name, it must be counted. So let me show you one of the four sample ballots. So this would be typical uh, of one of the 17 ballots where the O in no is filled out. And so there were 17 of these that were put before the canvassing board. And I argued in each one that there's a law that applies to this. And the law is if it's near the name, then it shall be counted. Well, the, the voter's mark here is on or in the name, so it must be counted. And basically, I repeated this 17 times to the board. And your 
school board chair was against me every time. Every time he violated the law. That's 17 separate violations. The law could be no clearer than that. The law and application, if the mark's near the name, but here are the mark's on the name. So on that, we won 13 of the 17 ballots at the canvassing board. Can you believe that? So they're virtually identical. You talk to anyone, it's the same issue. So 13 votes got changed, which brought us within uh, five votes. They then counted four of these on three, two votes or something like that. Maybe there's one that was 5-0 as, as non-votes. So at least the school board chair was consistent, right? The mayor designate was uh, right on 13 of the identical ballots and wrong on the others. So that leaves us with four ballots that should have been counted as no's and a five vote margin. So there's one more ballot. And that's this one, and I know it's hard to see, but there's a, the no oval is filled in, the yes oval is filled in, and then there's an X on top of the yes uh, oval, similar to the question number one. And maybe we should, uh, maybe we can pass that one around. And so with respect to that uh, ballot, uh, I made my arguments based on that second rule, uh, another rule that I indicated, and that is there's a rule that if a voter attempts to erase a vote or obliterate a vote, then that too has to be taken account of. And so here, the, the instructions were to fill in the oval. Uh, I think the most logical thing from the face of the ballot to determine is the voter filled in the oval for yes, uh, changed, the voter changed the voter's mind, put an X on it, and then filled in the oval for no. And that is the way that the instructions read. That's the most logical way to read the ballot. Uh, the, at that point, the canvassing board uh, solicited uh, opinions from election judges. And this was a violation of the statute saying that all decisions must be made on, based on the face of the ballot. So that was another violation. Anyway, they voted, uh, I think it was 5-0, to reject that ballot. Then we uh, filed our election contest in the uh, district court. And initially, uh, a former chief judge was appointed. Uh, we had an opportunity to strike that judge. And then Judge Galler took it. And Judge, uh, these have to be an expedited proceeding. We were just challenging the five ballots, because if we won on the five ballots, then the election would be a tie and it would be thrown out. Uh, judge Galler said at the hearing, uh, I announced that all 10 Washington County judges have recused themselves because we have oversight authority over the clerk of court who was on the canvassing board. So then when we saw that, then we knew under the rules that if all the judges of Washington County had recused themselves, like Judge Galler said, uh, then the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Gilday, would assign the judge the case. But we were then surprised because then we got a court order appointing, you know, remember we're in Washington County here, appointing the former uh, Chief Judge of the Ramsey County District Court to hear the case. And she's sort of famous, uh, Kathleen Guerin, because she was a, a judge on the Frank and Coleman uh, uh, race, uh, where uh, many of us think that that wasn't done properly. And, and also on the on allotment case, it was decided against Governor Plenty. You recall that case? So I, I think I got that right. And so th th that wasn't our concern, though. I've been before uh, Chief Judge Guerin, and she's a fine judge, and she's unbiased, and so forth. But our concern was how she got assigned. And so I, we sent a letter in saying that should be reconsidered because the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court should make the assignment, not the Chief Judge of Washington County District Court, who Judge Galler told us, because he's in Washington County, had recused himself. The Chief Judge then looked at the five ballots. The law is incredibly clear that all five ballots should be counted. Remember, the statute is, if it's in, the ballot shall only be rejected if it's impossible to determine the voter's intent based on these principles and the marks of the ballot. So if you'd imagine, you know, our judges feel so free now that even if the legislature uses a word like impossible, that's still sort of subjective, right? It's sort of like, well, I can determine what impossible is. I can, well, it's impossible for me. It's, you know, and, and so that's what, how the order reads, is that it was impossible for the judge to figure it out because the judge had doubts. But when you think about a democratically enacted law, it's an instruction. 
it really has to be impossible. Uh, if we don't follow the statutes according to their ordinary meanings, we're going to lose our sense of democracy. Because if the judges and agencies and election judges and canvassing boards and everyone else isn't following the common meaning of the words in our statutes, you know, we're toast. It's a sort of we lose out to the vague notions of a republic laden with experts and elites and all these people, right? But we, operating inductively, say, no, we want these statutes followed. We're concerned about the Coleman Franken race being messed up. We don't want any more of these elections to be messed up by canvassing boards. So let's put right in there that you have to count the vote uh, unless it's impossible to figure it out. And we expect that these reforms be followed, but they don't, it doesn't happen. And so what does it say about our culture? What does it say about our institutions you know, and all of that? It's very difficult to see how we're going to work out of where we are if the laws we passed aren't followed by the agencies and, and school districts and townships and, and counties that we're trying to govern. And really the last part of what he has to say is the whole crux of the reason why we highlighted here on North Star Oasis. One thing he said is if we do not follow the statutes, we are going to lose our sense of democracy. And there is so much truth into that. And, you know, upholding the law, upholding the statutes, making sure that the intent, legislative intent, constitutional intent is adhered to. And that's the reason why the South Washington County School District issue is so important. And we will be giving you more updates on the appeals process as more developments are made known. But we're going to also keep the focus on the school districts because we had South Washington County School District 833 with an issue. Now we're going to move next door to the Stillwater School District, District number 834, 